There's a season three episode of the Mary Tyler Moore show where Moore attends the Teddy Awards. And the set is definitely the same set we're seeing here for the CBs. Hello, and welcome to the 18th installment of Fraser Fridays, where all the salads are tossed and all the eggs are scrambled. Today, we're looking at Season 1, Episode 18 of Fraser, entitled, And the Whimper Is. We're back to production order lining up here with episode airing, with episode code number 118, and we'll be in production order again next week, before bouncing around a bit at the end of the season. This episode originally aired on February 17th, 1994, and it pulled in an abysmal 16.7 million viewers, a drop of nearly half the viewership from last week's wonderful episode, losing 16.1 million viewers. This isn't just the steepest drop of the season, it's also the lowest rated episode of the first three seasons of the show. In fact, we won't see a lower rated one until 1996 during season four when ratings were just on a decline all over. Frasier isn't the only show down this week. Seinfeld also had a sharp drop to 25.4 million viewers, dropping nearly 10 million from the previous week. For whatever reason, the Thursday after Valentine's Day routinely sees a rating decline for Frasier. Seinfeld also had this problem for the first few seasons, but post-season five, this spot really stopped having a ratings decline for the show. I suspect this decline has to do with people watching the Winter Olympics, which is in its first week here. The Winter Olympics ran on CBS, so NBC would have new shows on as counter-programming, and for the first time in 1994, six new events were introduced to the Winter Olympics. It's interesting that, at this point in time, half of Fraser's audience from last week would leave to watch the Olympics, while only a third of Seinfeld's did. Based on future ratings, it seems like the core Fraser audience is always more of a devoted Olympic fan than Seinfeld's. And The Whimper Is was directed by James Burroughs, who, with the exception of episode 20, will direct every episode for the remainder of the season. It is written by the future Disney Channel writers, Cy Duquesne and Denise Moss. This is the fourth of five episodes this team will write. They'll return for one final time with episode 20 and act as supervising producers for the remainder of the season before leaving the Frasier production family. This episode starts back with the nothing happening intro. This is the first time we've seen this intro since episode 13, and marks the fourth time for the season overall we've had it, tying it with the lights all over the city at four times apiece. From there, the episode starts with a close-up of the Fraser Show poster we first saw it during the Christmas episode, and pans slowly across the hall, taking a moment to focus on Bulldog's poster as well. It's nice to see that the posters are still there, and I'm very glad they got added as background to a lot of these episodes. From there, we go into what I thought would surely be the return of the guest caller scene. Which, by the way, out of the last five episodes, the show where Lilith came back with Timothy Leary is the only episode we've had a guest caller on. Instead of having a guest caller here, we have our expectations subverted and see Roz's workstation left empty. I have a little bit of mixed feelings about this. Yes, Roz's love of gossip is well established, so from that perspective, I can see her ditching her work to listen to gossip. On the other hand, during the Christmas episode, Roz stayed in her seat until Fraser gave her permission to leave, which feels a little bit contradictory to what we see here. The award Roz is so excited about is the CBs, or Seattle Broadcasting Awards. This isn't a real award, by the way. The WSAB, Washington State Association of Broadcasters, did have an annual Broadcaster of the Year Award from 1985 to 2005. Jay Shannon Sweetie of KVIAM from Seattle won in 1994. I couldn't find too much information on this winner, but it appears they hosted a news show. We get a couple of returning radio station characters in this episode with Patrick Kerr's Knoll 
This marks Noel's second appearance on the show, and his second date with Roz. This is also Kerr's last appearance on the show until season three. For a character that shows up 22 times on the show, I'm surprised we're not going to see any more of him for over a year. Kerr does a good job here and is a little more fun than his last appearance. And he's turned into an absolute punching bag for both Roz and Frasier, but particularly Roz. I'll touch on this more in a little bit. Before we get back to him, we also get the return of Harriet Harris's BB Glazer. And she's just as much fun as she was in Selling Out, and she's somehow even more devious. We get to see how she plays with her clients when she tells Frazier she has to go talk with her other clients who weren't nominated and tell them what a worthless award it is. This is directly after she tells Frazier what a great honor it is for him to get this nomination. This is a really good line and really underscores how BB operates. The It's All Relative actress has nine appearances remaining in the series and will next show up in season two. We get an interesting line from Roz where we learn she's been in the producing business for 10 years, and this is the first time she's been nominated for an award. At the time of this episode's release, Gilpin was 32. Assuming Roz is the same age as her actress, that means she's been working as a producer since she was 22, which would line up nicely with her taking a job at KACL right out of college. I don't know if this minor tidbit will be contradicted later, but as of now, for my head canon, Roz's job at KACL is the only job she's ever had. A very Duquesne and Moss joke comes a little after the five minute mark when Fraser opens a quote $200 bottle of champagne to celebrate his nomination. If there's any moment that feels out of place, this is it. We've looked at the bottles of wine and champagne Fraser drinks before, they're always expensive and always have a name I'm probably butchering when I try to pronounce it. Many of those bottles have also been well over $200. For example, the bottle from Death Becomes Him, which Niles claims is his own, was around a $350 bottle of wine. My point being, Fraser has always been shown to have a lot of wines and champagnes that are much greater in value than a $200 bottle. Even if he made a mess of it, like he did in this scene, I don't for a second think he'd make a toast for something that he was this excited about with a bottle that was that cheap, that he doesn't even have a name for. We again get evidence that Daphne is not quite part of the family. I've commented on this in the past, and Daphne actually calls it out here. She thanks Fraser for treating her like part of the family, then, a moment later, is forced to open the door, because Fraser doesn't want to stand up and get it. I'm not sure answering the door is really part of Daphne's job, but that's neither here nor there. I'm split on if this line is a nice bit of self-awareness for Daphne, or just too easy of a joke. Either way, I liked it. We know Roz and Daphne have met a few times in the past, but what we didn't realize until now is that they're something of friends at this point, which makes sense and I like. We know Daphne doesn't get out of the house without Martin that much, and doesn't have that many friends. Since her and Roz are around the same age, I like that they're forming a friendship, even if it is off screen. We've got another interesting bit of synchronicity, like with a football player in episode 14 here, with Roz's ill-fated date with Brad McNamara from Channel 8. Five years after this episode aired, in 1999, a man named Brad McNamara joined the Channel 9 news desk in Wales, where he worked for 17 years as the executive producer of the Cricket Desk. Roz and Daphne's friendship has apparently reached the point where they're all right sharing clothing. Roz asks if Daphne has a push-up bra she can borrow, and John Mahoney just has the best and funniest reaction of the episode to this comment. The man's eyes are perfection for this statement. During this scene, we also get a list of everyone else who was nominated for the award. Every one of which Martin thinks is excellent. We only get to actually meet one member of the competition, and that's Fletcher Gray, played by John McMartin. McMartin is a that guy who was in that thing actor. McMartin has been active in acting since the 1960s. Prior to that, he joined the army right out of high school and became a paratrooper. Once his term there expired, 
He went to college, but didn't graduate, and ultimately made his way to an acting debut in an off-Broadway production of Little Mary Sunshine, where he won a Theatre World Award. From there, he worked his way up to Broadway, while appearing in occasional TV spots, starting with a few episodes of As the World Turns. From there, he continued to act on both stage and screen, appearing in classics ranging from All the President's Men to Hawaii Five-0, to The Rockford Files, to The Mary Tyler Moore Show, to Magnum P.I. He also had a fairly large role in a Season 7 episode of Cheers, where he plays a colleague of Fraser's who wrote a book about fidelity and said 100% totally, though really, he definitely didn't cheat, celibate from his wife for the 10 months of his book tour. It's a decent episode, and I'd say it's probably a little stronger than this episode of Frasier. He died in 2016 at the age of 86. McMartin has been in a lot of things, but the woman playing his mother is a much more interesting actress. Mrs. Gray is played by Maxine Elliott Hicks. If you haven't heard of her, that's to be expected. Hicks is the first actress we've had with roles from the 30s, 20s, and 19-teens. In fact, her first appearance was over a century ago, in a 1915 short film. Hicks was a bona fide silent movie star and appeared in over 200 credited and uncredited roles from 1914 to 1937. She was in silent classics including The Eternal Mother and The Poor Little Rich Girl. There's a film that came out last Christmas called Babylon about the silent film era in Hollywood and how the transition to the speakeasies was difficult to impossible for some actors due to the total change in acting technique required. The film's not bad, and the story is interesting, but it's very explicit and has an overly long three-hour runtime. If you don't mind the explicit scenes in it, it's beautifully choreographed and has an interesting look at a time in Hollywood that's mostly forgotten today. Anyway, I brought this up to point out that Hicks managed to make the transition from silent films to speakeasies before leaving acting for almost 40 years because of a dispute with Jack Warner of Warner Brothers. When she returned to acting, she did a number of one-off TV appearances, including The Jeffersons, Different Strokes, Designing Women, and Quantum Leap. She had a recurring role of the nun Sister Ethel on the comedy Just the Ten of Us. She passed in 2000 at the age of 95. There's a few other blink and you miss some guest spots. The man named Peterson, who greets Frazier when he arrives at the CBs, is played by Mark Sawyer. Sawyer did a handful of small roles in the 80s and 90s on both TV shows and made-for-TV movies. He appeared in an episode of Cheers as a customer, an episode of Doogie Hazzer MD, and most notably, he acts as the voice for many of the characters in the Math Blaster video game series. The committee member Frazier gave a watch to is played by Eileen Fitzpatrick. She only has a handful of minor roles to her acting career, but Many of them are Frasier adjacent shows, including Knots Landing, Cheers, Wings, Saved by the Bell, The New Class, and Cagney and Lacey. She retired from acting in 1995 and has since made appearances in both voice and motion capture for video games, including Mafia 3 and Red Dead Redemption 2. Our MC, Keith, is played by Ren T. Brown. Brown is a that guy who was in that thing actor who's been routinely busy since his debut on a 1985 episode of Knight Rider. He's appeared on Dallas, Knott's Landing, Veggie Tales, Seinfeld, Walker, Texas Ranger, Curb Your Enthusiasm, and The Simpsons. He had a recurring role in the Flipper TV show and Bless This House. He also had a starring role on all 22 episodes of the Whoopi Goldberg comedy Whoopi. Tawny, a.k.a. Miss CB, is played by Trish Ramnish. She's appeared on Cheers, 19 episodes of Fame, and most recently, a 45-episode stint on General Hospital. Returning to Kerr's Knoll here, we get to see him being a total nerd when he shows up as Roz's date to the CBs. He flashes the Vulcan symbol to Frasier before being verbally abused by Roz for the rest of the episode. It's a good use of Kerr's character, and his excitement over seeing Roz, even while she's abusing him, is great. There's a few other tidbits I want to discuss real quickly. 
The title cards in this episode have a different feel than usual, as, like last week, they're more directly interacting with the episode, and are straight up telling you what the upcoming scene will be about. I'm not sure if I prefer them this way, or in the usual way, where it just steals a line from the upcoming scene, and it only makes sense afterwards. There's a Season 3 episode of the Mary Tyler Moore Show, where Moore attends the Teddy Awards, and the set is definitely the same set we're seeing here for the CBs, right down to the same chairs being used. So I think that's pretty cool to see NBC reusing a set here. The joke at the end of this episode, where Frasier ditches Roz for a pretty girl, is extremely resonant with the ending of Death Becomes Him, where another pretty girl, attending the doctor's funeral, pulls Frasier out of his slump. Since it's Frasier's own show, I understand it, but it's a little strange coming from the Frasier of Cheers, who was never shown as all that lucky with women, and certainly not someone who was frequently hit on by women years younger than him. The coda scene is sweetly funny, and easily in the top half of them for the series thus far. Hicks stealing Roz's very pink drink is a really nice ending of the episode, and to this Roz-heavy plotline. Frasier doesn't actually wear any new ties this episode. In fact, he doesn't even wear a regular tie. All he wears is a bow tie. He was last seen wearing a bow tie during the Bachelor auction in episode 14. Martin and Niles both also sport a bow tie this week, each for the first time. Niles is the only character to actually wear a regular tie here. This is a new tie for the series and is joining the list of fairly abstract tie designs Niles has been sporting since the return from Christmas break. With Fraser wearing no new ties this week and Niles sporting two, this ties the brothers up at 21 different ties each so far for the series. Martin has now worn the neck accessory four times or just over 20% of the time, which is honestly much more often than I would have guessed after the pilot episode. This episode leaves me with some mixed feelings. Duquesne and Moss are still not great writers for Frasier in my book, but they do have a decent grasp on how to formulate a sitcom plotline. The show's throw stronger than any of their other episodes here. The pacing for this episode and the amount of jokes are spot on. I'm just not sure they all land right. And even the ones that do, they don't always feel true to the characters. We have the scene with the nameless French champagne, which I feel a lot more willing to let go if it was even given a name. We have the ridiculous background joke about Niles accidentally becoming a waiter for the event. I actually found this pretty funny, but it made no sense for Niles' character whatsoever. Everything we know about Niles says he would never, under any circumstances, do something like this. We also have some good in this episode, with a lot of Raws. In fact, unless I'm mistaken, this is the most Raws heavy episode we've had to date, and this feels very true to what we've seen from her character before. We also have a really cool guest star with Hicks, and we have the return of both Bibi and Noel. For the former, she feels exactly like she did last time we saw her, and for the latter, I feel like we get to learn a bit more about just how nerdy he is. The plot line for this episode also feels a little off. Like most of the Duquesne and Moss episodes, this one involves Fraser learning a lesson. There's nothing wrong with that, but I find I'm definitely enjoying the episodes a lot more that are about the characters, like last week's Midwinter Night's Dream, than the ones where Fraser just learns a moral lesson, like in this episode or Death Becomes Him. If you want to see Fraser and Roz hatch a merry plan, give this 6.5 out of 10 episode of Fraser a shot. <laughs>